Hello and welcome to Fueling Around with me, Jason Plato, and the second most famous helmet I know is Dave Vitti. Hello. Fueling Around is powered by Adrian Flux. As the UK's largest specialist insurance broker, Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Now then, um, Dave, how are you, pal? I'm very good. Thank you, Mr. Plato. And yourself? Um... I think fair to middling. Mm, okay, I mean you're you're looking above average, I would say. That's great. No, I mean it's it's That's good. Great. I mean you, you know you, you you look above average, and also I like the fact that for this edition, you know the keen viewers will notice that you are recording from your trophy cabinet. <laughs> no, it's a table which had <laughs> boxes with leads hanging out of them. I'll, I'll give you a demo. Okay. That'd be nice. Oh, look at that. You see, there's actually more there than I thought at first. <laughs> so that's what it looked like. Sure. Until I thought, shit, I can't because I've just moved as well, you know. Yeah, yeah. And it was just, I mean, there was all sorts hanging out of there. I mean, there was an old co copy of Razzler mm. uh, and a load of cables. Yeah, I mean, you know, it, this, some of those references, you're not even allowed to broadcast these days. <laughs> Well, well, we should know this because we looked at the that um, that checklist the other week. We did, we did, we did, we through. did, and and indeed this is. This... But you'll cut that bit out. Yeah, absolutely, that's fine. Because really, we need to bolt headstrong and with speed and swift of pace to the introduction to this week's special guest, and it is a special person, I think. You're dead right. Our guest today is a gentleman who's single-handedly responsible for some of the best automotive TV moments over the last twenty years. He's a writer. He's an author, still makes him a writer, mm -hmm. a journalist, also a writer, mm -hmm. a podcast host, and a man responsible for the TV Goliaths that were Top Gear and the Grand Tour. It is, of course, Mr. Richard Porter. Hello, mate. Hello. How are you? What an intro. Oh, there you go. That's, you that's, see, that's we... all factual. It's, it's true. It's all, it is. It's all true. It's all fact. You know, and, and Richard, welcome to the show. We like to sometimes invite on guests of more successful automotive podcasts on our own <laughs> in the hope that their presence in our world might result in some associated audience uplift. Um, I also ought to say for people who are watching the video stream on this, I thought oh, I'll be really clever here because I'll wear one of our bits of merch from, oh, I see, from yeah. Smith & Sniff, my podcast. Yeah, the camera frames it out and the microphone does <laughs> as well. So I've not been as clever as I thought, but it's because my um, podcasting partner, Johnny Smith, mm. uh, was on an American podcast a couple of weeks ago, I think. And I listened to it and he didn't mention our podcast once. Right. And so as soon as I finished listening to it, I sent him a message and gave him a right bollocking for that and went, <laughs> what are you doing here? Like your one job was to promote our show. <laughs> but he promoted, obviously he's got other things to promote. Yeah. He did that. So I thought I'll show Johnny how it's done. I'll wear the merch mm. and then they'll have to talk about Smith and Sniff and look, it hasn't worked out. So well, thank you for bringing it up. To be honest with <laughs> you, we were, you know, even, even due to the fact that we can't see your impressive merch and the, and the branding, which has been beautifully designed, we were going to talk about it anyway. So for those very few people that aren't familiar with yours and Johnny's craft, tell us about the podcast. <laughs> well, I mean, it's, 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 it's Johnny Smith who people may know, um, from Fifth Gear on TV and, and yep. now more recently The Late Break Show on YouTube, which is, uh, he's just passed half a million subscribers. So that's mm. very great going. But, um, that's why we had him on the show as well for the same kind of yes. uplift that we're hoping and to I get think from you. you did mention Smith & Sniff on this show. I can't mm. remember, or did I have to tell he, him off for that did. as well? No, <laughs> it's did. so no, useless. No, it's embarrassing how bad we are at, at many things, but we have been friends for years and we used to sometimes sort of see each other at stuff, you know, car events. We once went to the US to Pebble Beach for the concourse event oh, yeah. there and shared a car for ages driving up the California coast. And we said to each what? other, it's a shame we're not filming this mm. because we, you know, we get on very well and, and we chat a lot of nonsense, but maybe people would find it amusing. We just don't know. So then belatedly, it took us about five years after that to get together and film some stuff because Johnny rang me one day and went, I've got to go to Telford to pick up a <laughs> Honda V6 engine out of a Rover 800, mm. do you want to come? And I went, okay. And then, oh, actually, I've got, I've got a big SUV press car that I've borrowed. It's a Kia Sorento. Maybe we can get the engine <laughs> in the back, the, of the back of that. Yeah. Well, the thing is, also, again, just sort of how useless <laughs> we are, we both kind of went, 
engine will probably fit in that, not really knowing if it would. Mm. But, you know, we took our you best still shot. went to Telford anyway without actually still drove, measuring well, it. Yeah. I mean, it, I drove from, I lived in North London at the time, so I drove from North London up to uh, near Stamford in Lincolnshire, where Johnny mm. lives. Mm. And then we drove to Telford, <laughs> which, as any middle-aged man worth their salt knows, going east to west across the country is a bit of a nightmare. So... <laughs> Yeah. Um, we did that and we filmed the whole thing. We just gummed some, you know, little um, GoPros to the to the screen of the car. We filmed the whole thing. We picked up the Rover V6, uh, or the Honda V6 from a Rover, from a Rover 800 enthusiast in Telford, which thankfully went in with the guy's engine crane. And then we drove back and we still filmed it. And we still filmed, we even filmed the bit where I went, by the way, John, have you, have you got an engine crane? He went, oh no. So I, <laughs> How, how are we going to get the Honda V6 out of the Kia that doesn't belong to me? And he went, oh, it's fine. I've got some planks in the garage. And we even filmed, and thankfully, it's somewhere, and I don't know where this footage has gone, we've got the, we've got the moment where, when the planks snapped and a 2.7-litre no Honda V6 rolled no towards way. our feet. And I jumped out of the way in the most unheroic manner possible because I was wearing Converse All-Stars, and I thought, these are about as far from steel toe cap boots as you can get. <laughs> and um. And then this footage just sat on my computer because it was so much hours and hours and hours and hours. And I just didn't know what to do with it. So it's a very long winded way of saying that it took years for Johnny and I to finally start making YouTube videos, having done this trial run. And um, and then when COVID came along, we were sort of forced to pivot yeah, into, yeah. Like, into podcasts because we couldn't meet up anymore to film in cars. And that's what we did. We just we just thought, well, we'll do our usual shtick, which is just we chat about stuff. We don't plan anything. We just kind of, you know, individually make notes of things that have popped into our heads. And then mm. we'll go, hey, you know what I was thinking about? And off we go. And I think the best thing we did was we said, well, you know, these are these are strange and difficult times that we're we're launching this podcast into. And everybody's a bit weirded out. And it's it's, you know, we don't know what's going on in the world. Let's not mention that. Let's never talk mm. about the outside world. We'll create our own little world. And it's full of Austin princesses and Matra ranchos and <laughs> terrible 80s bomber jackets with promotional slogans written on the back. And that's our that's our world. That's our internal monologue that we're just going to spill out mm. into this podcast. And it seems to have worked. And so, uh, yeah, we're sort of, we, we kind of jockey with a few others, you guys included, in the, in the top 10 car podcasts in the UK and other countries as well. Mm. And um, so, yeah, it's, sort of, it's going all right, I think. I think your podcast is great, yeah, actually. I, I mean, agree. the last time I saw jo Johnny, he had, um, I think he had about two dozen crates of brute aftershave <laughs> in the back of his car. <laughs> right. Tell us about that. Because that was, was that, for, was that yours? Yes. Well, so one of the things that I love dearly about Johnny is how absolutely random he is and how he has certain things that, that amuse him beyond reason. And one of them is 70s aftershave and particularly brute, because I think it's it's your classic, isn't it? Yeah, that yeah, old yeah, yeah. And one of Johnny's talents is actually he's very good at sort of painting a picture kind of he's he's like a sort of brilliant amateur sociologist because he'll sort of be able to say if you said to him look i found this bottle of some other aftershave from the 70s blue stratos oh, maybe or something like that Ooh, well, I th is that 80s because i'm a bit of a fan of the blue stratos <sighs> actually do you know what i think you might be right i think that might be an 80s an 80s fragrance oh, have you oh, smelled blue stratos recently no not recently I, go I, I, I you can still buy it fresh is it quite is it, it's like a fresh smell it's quite fresh, quite sort of citrusy almost, I would say. Mm. But if you're of a certain age, and Dave, I think you and me are particularly about the same age, aren't we? So it's like, it's it, it, you'd sniff it and you're immediately a disco in a scout <laughs> <laughs> wishing that girls so would talk to you. On. And they won't, even though you smell citrusy and fresh. Yeah, so yeah, 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 yeah. It's a Proustian rush, the like of which I haven't had for a long time when I first sniffed some Blue Stratos. What I'd like to get hold of next is, and I don't think they do still make this, is Rapport. Do you remember that? No, I don't remember that one. I think that was late 80s, early 90s. And see, look, now I'm talking with enthusiasm about old aftershave, which yeah, is insignia, entirely Johnny's fault. Insignia was another one, wasn't it? Was Insignia? Yes, yes that was that was. Do you another. remember the the promotional hook for Insignia was that it wasn't just aftershave; it was shower gel and shampoo. Oh, because they tapped into, and I kind of went, "Oh, I relate to this. This is true." They tapped into the concern that if you use different products with different smells. Mm. 
you were, you got kind of clashing smells. I see. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was one consistent smell. So you washed your hair with insignia, and then your body wash, and then you put on insignia like moisturizer yeah, and uh, a, signature, a signature scent. Your set. Mm. You're all insignia'd up. The amazing thing is, when apparently when um, Vauxhall decided they weren't going to continue with the Vectra name and they wanted yes. to rename their medium-sized saloon hatchback, they discovered that whoever made insignia smelly stuff had blanket <laughs> trademarked it. And you know how trademarks work? There's different categories and things yeah, like that. Yeah, they had to just go and check with them and went, "If we call our new car the Insignia." You're not going to sue us, are you? Because it seems like you've got this locked down. They went, no, you're fine. You can have it for cars. No one's going to confuse a car. <laughs> with a yeah, yeah. Shower gel. Yeah. Product. So, no, I think, was that 90s? Insignia? Anyway, the reason we have the brute is because Johnny finds brute funny. And he finds it so funny that he went, we should start selling it through our merchandise shop and do, like, um, Father's Day bundles. So oh, okay. Father's yeah, Day yeah. card for your dear old dad. But you also get one of our mugs or T-shirts and a bottle of Brut. And amazingly, not many people were that interested in this offer. <laughs> Johnny bought like about 200 bottles of Brut wholesale. Yeah. So we still can't get rid of the bloody stuff either, yeah. which is a shame. I must admit, it, when it, the boot opened on, on, you know, on his car, and I just peered in and went, what the hell is all that? <laughs> yeah, it just was so random. But, it's, but you know Johnny, Jason. I mean, that's the, it's, it's oh, no, I know you just bit. go... It's just so I've, I've, Johnny. I've done a couple of car trips with him for TV, and we, we you know, we, we we went all the way down through France over the Alps to, to Geneva. I mean, just every every hour, I just have to turn around and kind of look at him and go, "What's going on in your mm. head?" Because he, he'd see, he'd go, "Stop, stop, get off the get off the road." There's a there's a scrapyard over there. And I've seen a yeah. Renault Four. Let's go and have a look at it. Yeah, yeah. What? I think that's when we when we shared a car when we went to the US to this Pebble Beach thing, and I think it was 2010, um, we were in a Jaguar XJ driving up the coast in a convoy with some other people, but we were, we got ahead, and then we saw, I think it was a Dodge Charger, and half under a tarpaulin the side of the road. And one of the things that Johnny and I like to play when we're together is what we call CSI tarpaulin. We see a car under a cover. Just from the wheels? Well, yes. I mean, mm. if you've got a bit of wheel... Mm. You've got a good chance. If there's no wheel, you're going on shape. Yeah. And yeah. tarpaulins can be deceptive things. So, you know, you've got to use all your skill. But we love playing that game. And we saw this charger. It was only half under a tarp. So we knew what it was. But it warranted a stop. Mm. I think I was driving. And I full <laughs> ABS'd it. And then just veered. We were in some woodland. Veered to the side of the road, sort of up into the trees. Mm. And we were out. And we ran... The next car in our convoy came along and they absolutely anchored it on, which we assumed they'd gone, oh, look, there's a Dodge Charger. But yes. no, they thought we'd had a crash because they just saw our <laughs> in the trees. And they came running over there, like, are you guys okay? And we're like, yeah, we're just yeah. looking at this Dodge Charger. It's a 69, I think. Look at it. It's got the same taillights. And it was just, and that's, yeah, that's that's life on the road. Well, I mean, that's bad as yeah. We can't resist this sort of nerdery. And I think this is partly why we get on so well is because we just geek out whenever we have the chance. So, mate, I, I'm intrigued to know the story about you know Top Gear, yeah. all that stuff. Tell us, tell us how, how it all begun. Yeah, you know, your um, involvement. Well, I got my break in in TV in sort of work that I wanted to do on old Top Gear, which was on a Thursday night. Mm. Uh, still, uh, it was just a sort of half hour, quite sensible magazine program, relatively, and. Uh, they they did a little advert. John Bentley, who people might know from the gadget, yeah, show, yeah, yeah, I do, yeah, uh, and who I think you you guys probably know. John. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. and um, and John <laughs> popped up during the during the this episode of Top Gear on a Thursday night, and went, "We're looking for researchers. Send three ideas in and a CV, and we'll get back to you." And then so I did because I was like, I was working in a shop. I was working in a branch of Next at the time, and I just you know I, I desperately wanted to work on Top Gear. That was like dream job. Yeah. Yeah. I sent in some stuff and I never thought I'd, you know, I'd get anywhere because that would be impossible. And um, months later, they got in touch and went, would you come for an interview? And I put on my, the great thing about working at Next was you got free, free suit. <laughs> so I put on my best new season, you know, sort mm. of whatever it was, spring, summer, 98. Um, Smelling yeah. of insignia. <laughs> I went to Stratos on that occasion, Dave, because I wanted to be yeah. fresh and citrusy, but, uh, but it, then it clashed with my shampoo, which created a terrible impression. Um, I was no, I wore a very jazzy tie, as was the sort of the fashion at the time, and um, 
And when I walked into the interview room, John Bentley was there and he was wearing the same tie or very similar. And he went, uh, I like your tie. And I went, oh, I like yours. And he went, yeah, yes. <laughs> and that was sort of it. That was kind of, I mean, obviously I had to do an interview. I didn't get the job off the back of that. But I think it it broke the ice in quite a good way. And um, and then, yeah, I got offered a job as a junior researcher. So uh, that was my sort of break into TV. Jeremy was still doing the show at that point. So uh, I worked with Clarkson for a few months and then he left. Mm-hmm. And then was, carried was on. Tiff, was, was Tiff there then, or, or Tiff was there? Yeah, it was. The, it was yeah. what you might sort of call that people remember as the, the classic lineup of that show. So it was yeah. Clarkson, and then Tiff, Quentin Wilson, mm-hmm. Vicky Butler Henderson, yeah. uh, Steve Berry was still doing it. Oh, oh wow! Right. Yeah. As, in, um, as in Steve Berry, he's a big bikes guy, isn't he? Yeah, 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 yeah. And he it was a funny one because. He used to do, not every week he would do bikes. And this was the problem, I suppose. The bike coverage was inconsistent. And then he would sort of every so often pop up and just go, that's a new Yucate, in a very chewy <laughs> Lancastrian accent. And and bikers didn't really like it. I think they felt that it was sort of token. That, you know, bikers, I think it's because bikers tend to be fully committed to yeah, the yeah, world yeah, of bikes. Yeah. And they felt that Steve was sort of wasn't doing it justice, but but he was still on it. And we used to actually have him do car items as well. And then Tony Mason as well. Do you remember Tony? Yeah, the old, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. The guy who was a rally navigator, sort of most famously for getting a big snowball in the face <laughs> on one of the, that always shows up on those outtake shows. So it was a good lineup of presenters. And one of the things that was amazing to me, coming from working in a shop, mm. was that all the presenters were really nice. You know, they were just like, I don't know what I expected, but the first person I worked with was Quentin Wilson. And I did, it wasn't Top Gear I did, it was the Cars the Star, which yeah, were 20-minute yeah, yeah. little profiles of an individual car. They were great, great little shows. And we uh, we were doing, because Top Gear used to have a hiatus in the summer, and we would do those instead from the same office. And I researched the first one of those that I worked on about the Larder, the original Larder Saloon. And then we weren't filming it for like another month or so. So the producer went, well, why don't you try writing a script? And I went, um, uh, oh, okay, uh, right, yeah. And I'd never written a script before. And he showed me, he gave me some scripts from previous episodes. So what, I got age, what, what age are you, Richard, sorry, at this point? Just to kind of I was 23. Okay. So the good thing about being 23 is that you do think you know it all in a yeah, way, don't you? Kind of, <laughs> yeah, yeah you know. that is true, isn't it? And you, and you, you sort of, you're kind of, you're kind of rubbery, aren't you? I mean, literally, like, you know, you can go out and have 19 pints of Stella Artois and fall over and just bounce back up. And the next day, you're like, oh, okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Whereas now, that would literally kill me. Mm. But um, also, you do, you sort of, I think, hopefully, you've got a bit of perhaps misplaced confidence. So, mm. so although I was a bit scared, I kind of went, and the producer actually, bless him as well, was very supportive. And he went, take your time. And because we've got time. So I did. So I wrote and rewrote and wrote and again this this script about the larder. And then Quentin came in for a meeting. And the first thing is it was like, oh my God, he's just like he is on the telly. Like <laughs> as if I thought maybe it was an actor playing the part that he's gonna come in and go, yeah. oh, what am I doing today? Okay, hang on, I'll do the voice. Yes, it's pretty as a picture of this Mercedes. And it wasn't, he's just that's Quentin, of course. He's he's who he is on the TV. Just it's just that he he swears more in real life, and that was quite a shock. <laughs> And he's going, no, this effing car. And I was like, oh, my God, it's the man off the TV saying a swear. But he was absolutely delightful. And, you know, and I, I actually I saw Quentin not that long ago for the first time in ages, and it was such a joy to see him again because he was very, very supportive of my career. Mm. And we sat down in this meeting, and he read through this script, and then he went, he looked at me, and he went, did you write this? And I said, yeah, yeah, I did. And he went, it's very good. And Yeah, brilliant. That was sort of all I needed, really, in yeah. terms of encouragement, and just but the relief and the elation, and and that that sort of, I, I suppose you know, a pivotal moment where I kind of went, oh hello, I could. Uh, sorry, I don't know if you can hear that. My dog is just going bananas downstairs mm-hmm. because the postman is here. It's such a cliche, but um, so uh, that was kind of the point at which I went, I might be able to do this because mm. I, like, I like writing. I just didn't know whether I was actually any good at it, and then. After that, I just kept writing stuff, you know. So I wrote a few more Cars of Stars and uh, and then various bits and pieces for Top Gear. I used to write sort of scripts, you know, for, for Quentin and Vicky and Tiff. And obviously, they make them their own, you know. They yeah, don't just yeah, go, yeah, yeah. I'll take this. But they, you know, busy people at the time, they liked having that head start. Mm. Someone that they could trust to sort of, you know, give them the framework and a, and a story structure and things like that. So that was sort of how I how I got rolling. And that was, I did two years there and then um, went off to do other things because the BBC was slightly sort of meddling in Top Gear 
in that well-meaning way that they do. And they installed a new producer and she was given a brief to sort of kind of revamp the show mm. a bit, but, but then got sort of, I think, slightly sold a dummy by the people who brought her in. And I remember once being in a meeting and somebody who'd been brought in went, why don't we do a review of motorway service station sandwiches? And I thought, I think I'm out of here. I think mm. I'm kind of... <laughs> I mean, and, you know, I, I sort of think about that now and go, if we'd have done that on the Top Gear that came about 2002 to 2015, yeah. we could have done it in a very silly way. You could way. have pulled it off, right? Yeah, because well, it, 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 well, it would have been steeped in irony as well, which which is yeah. a difference. But I mean, I guess, sorry, just to, so in in terms of this period that you, you, you mentioned, the 2002 onwards, I guess... Mm having cut your teeth in the earlier incarnation with the likes of Quentin Wilson, et cetera, et cetera, when it then came to be Clarkson, Hammond and May, you were, you were obviously not just going on there in a sort of researcher point of view. You'd already sort of proven your worth, I guess. And so did, did, did the presenters say we, we want Richard to be our driving force for, for want of a better term? Um, sort of. Yeah. I, I'd gone. I left Old Top Gear. I did a couple of things. One of them was um, making a car magazine on CD-ROM, which wow. I mean, it, it, bear in mind this was what two thousand, I suppose, mm. two thousand one. And now it sounds like you might as well. I was doing a car magazine on papyrus because it's <laughs> so out of date. But at the time, it was like wildly futuristic. Mm. And what, almost, what, what was it called, Rich? Uh, it was called Cars on CD. It never launched. The, 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 do you remember, sort of, well, this is 20 odd years ago now, there was this kind of what was called at the time the new media boom. And it wasn't just websites, it was kind of techie ways of doing stuff. Right. And well, I remember that you remember the little mi mini CDs. And there were yes. stuck on magazine fronts. Mm. Yes. Right? Mm. Well, yeah, oh, what's on there? Funny enough, where, where I am now in my little office, there's I've got all down here you can't see on camera, like magazines, all my archive of magazines. And I was digging out an old copy of Evo the other day to look up something. And it was from 2001. And I'd forget it said free CD on the front of it. And you start, God, magazines used to do that all the time, didn't they? Whereas now you just yeah. go, well, what am I going to do with this? It's yeah. someone gave me a CD the other day. And I, and I went, oh, that's really kind. Thank you. You know, great. And I, I, I just went, I've got, got no slot. Play this. <laughs> I gave away my all my sort of hi fi yeah. stuff yeah. because I just had to admit defeat. I'd never use it. And it's, yeah. I realized I've got an old car that's got a CD player. <laughs> so, I'm gonna wait yeah. to so you have to sit on the drive but, to actually play anything. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It is. That. It's like this feels <laughs> sort of weird. I'm just, um, so uh, yeah, I did. I was doing various other things in, in uh, the early 2000s. And uh, yeah, the, the, the CD ROM company went bust because the new media boom was sort of predicated on a lot of BS and, and, and it collapsed. And I suddenly found myself unemployed. And I set up a website called Sniff Petrol, which was meant to be a sort of satire of cars and motorsport, mm. kind of like The Onion, the American website, yeah, The Onion, yeah, which yeah. I've always, always yeah. loved. And I was like, and obviously, you know, it wasn't as good as that, but I was trying my best. And one of the first people I was aware of that became a, a reader of Sniff Petrol was Jeremy Clarkson, weirdly. Mm. I don't know how he found out about mm. it. And he didn't always, I did it anonymously. Um, so he didn't know it was me doing it, but he sent me an email and went, I really like your site. It's very funny. Give me a ring. Again, this dates the story. He sent me his landline number. <laughs> <laughs> so I rang him at home and I went, yeah, hello, Jeremy. It's, it's me, Richard from top gear at pebble mill remember me and he was like oh okay so he he you know he then he it clicked and at that point he just went well anyway look i love your site i think it's really funny keep it up i'm gonna try and give it a mention in the paper at some point mm -hmm. give you a bit Brilliant. of push and that was it and then we sort of occasionally swapped emails like he'd send me an email and go i like this thing you did on the site and then i went to a motor industry lunch thing which i'd never normally get invited to so it's quite a random thing that I happened to go to and then and jeremy turned up and he, uh, as, as I was leaving, he went, where are you going? I was like, oh, I'm just going back to the station. He went, let's share a cab back to the station and then gave me the full sort of Blues Brothers yeah. were reforming the band. Yeah, yeah, he yeah. said, we're bringing Top Gear back. And I'd really like the attitude of your website in the show. So come in and have a chat. And I went in and had a chat with him and Andy Wilman, our producer, mm -hmm. and uh, Gary Hunter, who was the other exec producer in the early days. And 
I, again, so I'd have been 27 at that point. Okay. And so, again, just all of that sort of cockiness of being in, in your In your prime, though, I would say, that kind of age, well, don't you think? Yeah. You know? My knees didn't hurt back then, so I looked at it <laughs> fondly at the time when I was in, you know. Uh, you don't appreciate that at the time, do you? But mm. uh, so I, I remember sort of going, well, I don't want to be a researcher. Because I just, I don't know why. I mean, it's like I needed a job. I was unemployed. So it was a very, I mean arrogant thing to say really but, but you, were, you were on the cusp though of not just needing a job Richard you were on the cusp of arguably to well to people like ourselves the greatest job you can have I mean to actually well, be immersed yeah. in yeah. that that world like genuinely you know and you know as someone who who you know you and me are not dissimilar in so much as you know kind of working behind the scenes in in terms of what we've mm. done and trying to write and create things etc cetera, etc cetera. but for you to be in there as someone who loves their cars to be working mm. on the biggest car show in the world yeah. as the man who is is um you know sort of tasked with the job of pulling the strings and actually steering it it's the best job in the world isn't it yeah well i mean I didn't realize it at the time, you see, that it was going to be the biggest car show in the world because none of us did. Mm. And I remember going in for this meeting with Jeremy, Andy and Gary, and they said, let's tell you a bit about our plans. Um, we're going to do it in a studio. And I went, a car show in a studio? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't, I don't understand that. Work. And we're going to have a racing driver, but he never speaks or shows his face. And I was like... Oh, why would that, that doesn't make any sense. No, I don't think that's a good idea at all. And I remember leaving the meeting thinking, a bit worried about this. And then strangely, I then got a call from the people who were making Driven on Channel 4. Mm. Yeah. And they went, uh, we've seen your website and we, we, we like some of what we see on there. I wondered if you'd be interested in doing some writing. We're, we're sort of reformatting the show. Do you want to come in and have a chat? And I went in to see them and they went, now, we're going to base it in a studio. And I kind of, you know, <laughs> like, crap zoom on my face where I went... Are you? That's an interesting <laughs> idea. And then I had to go around holding this knowledge that both of, you know, I suppose at the time, Britain's, you know, two, two yeah, yeah. car shows. Like Blur and Oasis, was wasn't it? The same, yeah, it was Blur and Oasis. And, <laughs> and, uh, but as if Blur and Oasis were both planning to record <laughs> Country House or something and they didn't realise it. They'd written songs that were inadvertently yeah. the same. So in the end, I think Andy Wilman was just a bit more persuasive. And so I, I took the Top Gear job, but we blithered around. We didn't know what we were, you know, we had these ideas, you know, the studio there, that was, despite my protest, that was going to happen in the, in the Stig. And we'd, we'd got various other sort of vague ground rules, but there was so much we didn't know what we were going to do. And we had two brilliant researchers who were still very good friends of mine to this day, Roly French and Jim Wiseman, who... Jim has the most lateral brain I've ever encountered, possibly outside of Johnny Smith. And uh, and Rowley was, oh God, 23 maybe at the time. And he was into max power stuff yeah. and fast and furious. And he brought a sensibility from, if you like, sort of youth car culture that we wouldn't have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. So you've got these two young blokes who who just gave a whole different sort of set of inputs to things to contrast them with you know jeremy obviously knows what he's doing about making telly but he was he was still wanting you know fresh ideas mm. and they all just sort of came together but the first well, we did two pilot shows for the series and they were both dreadful and then the bead went there's no more money and you're supposed to be on air next week so could you just crack on so we just had to blither our way through it and the first series if you watch it back now they're on iplayer again actually it's it's strangely pedestrian. It's much more of a link between old Top Gear and what it became mm. than you might remember, certainly than I remember, you know, and I worked on the bloody thing. It's like we did talk a bit too much about cars and it took us a while to figure out that we were pulling in an audience who, you know, wanted to see those three being those three. Mm. We didn't put them together out in the field until series four, I think. You know, really? it's like everyone remembers, oh, we did all these road trips and things like yeah. that. First three series. Part of the whole concept was there are kind of, you know, our, our experts, our special mm -hmm. operatives. They go out into the field solo and they test a car or look at something or do whatever it is they're doing. They come back to the studio to compare notes. They're only together in the studio. That was sort of, you know, and, and, and then we went, what if they were together out of the studio? Would that work? And it mm. felt very sort of like, oh, this is a bit dodgy. And they bought cars for under £100. And then, again, as a sort of, 
symbol of how the scale of the show changed. You know, it's like suddenly we're driving across the Makadi Caddy in Botswana and we're doing all these sort of huge things and trying to fly a Reliant Robin into space. That first <laughs> challenge, they drove to Manchester and back. It's like there's nothing to it. And yeah, actually, you know, I remember it being quite a decent film. It probably is quite boring now if you watch it back. But these were the little steps that we sort of went on. So the show, it wasn't, you know, to, to become this behemoth. Yeah. It took quite a lot of time and a lot of missteps. And we didn't really know what we were doing, truth be told. Yeah, well, I mean, I remember that period well because I was on dri- Driven at the time. Mm, yeah. And I remember when, you know, I had the same response as you when I, when they said, look, we're we've got a new format. We're going to do it in a hangar at, Be- at Bentwaters indoors. Yeah. I'm like, what? And yeah, and this is, and it was just odd, but I've got a theory about that because the, the, the initial concept of both shows, like you said, you know, pop, two pop bands producing the same lyrics. <laughs> I reckon, I reckon someone heard something. Must have done. Probably thing. driven her. I something swear it wasn't me. BBC. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm not suggesting that for one minute, but because it was so similar. Yeah, yeah it was uncanny. It was yeah. It's yeah. almost that, you know, infinite monkeys with infinite typewriters will come up with the works of Shakespeare. <laughs> a small number of car TV producers yeah. in a room will eventually suggest the, the same, same thing. thing. By accident. But yeah, it's weird. Funny enough, Jason, you know, I just realised this. In my unemployed period, before I got the new Top Gear gig, I auditioned for Driven with you and Did Penny. You? Yeah. I, I came to, I can't remember where it was, you know, some, obviously it's an old airfield because it always was, wasn't it? But for, yeah, yeah, yeah. Doing yeah. TV in that era. But, oh, did you? I can't, I can't remember that. No, well, you wouldn't because I was crap. And I, I remember it was an Audi A4 and I had to drive it through a slalom. And I think you were in the front and Penny was in the back. And I had to just chat about the car and sort of, you know, try and interact yeah, yeah. with you guys. And I remember making a complete hash, both of the talking and the slaloming. And I remember particularly thinking, I've got two bloody racing drivers in the car and I just can barely steer it through some cones. It was, you know. I was going to ask you, had you any aspirations to actually sort of be out front and actually presenting it? Or did you always get the greatest kind of, um, I don't know, buzz or or sense of pride from actually creating those things that other people would deliver? But I didn't realise that you'd done a little bit of both. Well, I did on old Top Gear. One of my first jobs, once we'd done the Cars the Star that first summer, uh, John Bentley said, "We, I think we need some new presenters. Mm. Because uh, it's probably because Jeremy was leaving. And he thought, and John was the guy who sort of discovered Jeremy in that he bumped into a drinks party or something. And Jeremy went, I want to present on your show. And John went, oh, yes, I think you should. And um, so I, I was supposed to look for new presenters. And I I sort of was trying to find, you know, various younger car journalists. I put together this list and John sort of went down it. He went, oh, we've seen them, seen them. No, not him. No, yes. And then just kind of (laughs) dismissed everybody pretty much on the list. And then one day went, what about you? You're reasonably presentable. (laughs) And I I I was sort of wearing a really baggy sweater or something. I was like, am I? Okay, yeah. He went, yes, let's go go and screen test you. So... That evening, we uh, sort of at the end of the working day, we went down to a local park and he had a little, you know, handy cam because it was 1998. Mm. And he went, just go and talk about, a, talk about a car. So, but we didn't have a car. So for some reason, I, I was, pretended I was talking about the then new Peugeot 206 whilst gesturing at a bush. So the whole thing must have been very <laughs> surreal. So I did this for a bit and went, and there's, you know, there's engines are 1.1, 1.4, and it'll be on sale next month, and just did the usual shtick. And then went back to the office, and John sort of watched it back, I think, with one of the other producers, and went, this is, this is very good, yes, yeah, we, you should have a go. And the next thing, I was flying to Germany to review the uh, Subaru Legacy, which is uh, which actually made it to TV. Mm. Somebody... Um, put it on YouTube quite recently and sent me a link to it. And I, I sort of threw my fingers, I watched it back and I can see why what happened next is what happened because basically then I was supposed <laughs> to go to Spain to drive the new say at Toledo. And I was all getting ready and thinking of my script and everything. And then John just rang me up and went, yes, we're going to send Steve Berry instead. <laughs> and that was the end of my presenting career. That was it. Because I did that Subaru film wearing a short sleeved shirt. And I have quite long arms, I think, 
my wife disputes this and goes, everybody's arms are basically in proportion, but I don't believe that. And on telly, my arms become hugely sort of octopusy and weird. <laughs> like Mr. Tickle. So, like Mr. Tickle, mm. exactly that. Mm. But also that thing about, you know, again, bear in mind, I was 23 at the time. So I had youth on my side when it came to, you know, my sort of physique. And I was very skinny. But, you know, that thing about the camera adds five pounds or yeah, whatever. Yeah. It turns out when you're a very pallid, skinny bloke from Cheshire, the camera takes away five pounds and you look a little <laughs> emaciated. <laughs> and after I was on that, uh, that, that uh, Subaru item aired, one of my best mates from school rang me up and went, you didn't tell me you were ill. I'm, like, I'm not ill. And he went, well, you look it. And I was like, oh, thanks a lot. That's really great. Yeah, great. So I, I looked terrible. And I think my delivery was sort of, I'd spent too long studying the incumbent presenters. So my delivery comes across as a sort of pastiche of Jeremy Quentin and Tiff all rolled together. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Not in a good way. And so I think it was fair enough that I got told that Steve Berry would be relieving me of my duties. And that's, that was the end of it. And I kind of, so to answer your question, Dave, I kind of, at the time, you know, someone goes, do you want to be a TV presenter? You go, yeah, of course, mm. why not? That'd be great. And, uh, and obviously I saw, must have harboured that ambition a little bit because then I did screen tests with Driven, which I think was because I, one of my old colleagues from Pebble Mill had gone to produce there and he just said to me casually, we're looking for presenters. And I went, I, I could do that. And I gave him a VHS cassette of my Subaru review, which, and amazingly, they still gave me a screen test after presumably watching that, but that was as far as it went. And then I did sort of realise, I like other people doing my words because apart from anything else, if they get into trouble for them, I can just go home and hide. And it's like, no one knows who I am. So. I, have t- I have two questions on that front, actually. The first one is, and they're not really associated, do you tend to write with the voice of who's presenting in your head? If you're writing for Jeremy, do you write, do you have Jeremy in your head saying those words? Mm. That's the first thing. Yeah. And secondly, along those sort of lines, if this is indeed possible to answer, What's your proudest moment? Is there one moment in your career where you remember sort of thinking, do you know what? I wrote that. Or I did that. I created that. Do you know what I mean? There must be something where you, where you thought, yes, that was me. Well, first of all, yes, I do write with people's voices in, in my head. Mm. I think you have to. Mm. And I always find that quite interesting. I did a job recently for something completely unrelated, but I had to write for some some. A talent, as people say in the industry, uh, that I've never written for before. And so the first thing to do, I, I do anyway, is just go on YouTube and just watch loads of their yeah, stuff yeah. and get that voice locked yeah. in. And I'm always very, very proud when um, I do a job for a new producer, but writing for, you know, Jeremy or Richard, which I often do because if they're doing other shows and the producer says, Have you got a writer? As a lot of TV stars do. Mm. They're very generous and they'll always go, oh, well, you know, give Porter a call. Yeah. I'm sure he'll help out. And then I send stuff in and people go, oh, that really sounds like Jeremy. And they go, well, I have been working with him for 20 mm-hmm. years. <laughs> if I can't do his voice now, then there's no hope. Mm-hmm. But yes, it's a it's a, a thing. And I, 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 when we started doing the Amazon show, they sent over some ideas for promo films we were going to do with the presenters. So they'd scripted yeah. for the presenters. And I remember opening this file and going, Oh my God! Like it's like it opening a work. Milk. Yeah. It's like, yeah. you haven't got the voices here at all. But worse than that, it was Americans writing British English, which I think plenty of Americans can do. But it's always just a bit off yeah. if you don't get it right. And this was terrible. One of the things I've noticed American writers sometimes do if they go, "Oh, let's make it sound more British," just put the word "bloody" in. <laughs> But Americans don't say bloody, so they're not quite sure where it should go in the sentence. Yeah, yeah. So it would be like there were this, you know, these lines in these Amazon things that would go, oh, come on, bloody James, you slow idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody talks like that. Yeah. So it reminded me of a story about when Robbie Williams was trying to do his solo stuff and he had two American songwriters working with him and they, they handed him a load of songs and him and I think his, his producer went, and he's, they're, they're, they're very American Um do you think you could sort of, you know, make them a bit more British because Robbie's British and he kind of, you know, wants to be proud of that. And the next day they sent in a song and it was called The Blokes Down the Pub. <laughs> Very, too, too much. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, to answer your second question, there's, I mean, there's loads of stuff that I really, you know, I kind of, 
go, I did that. Mm. And there's an awful lot of stuff, which is a team effort. And I used to watch Top Gear on a Sunday night with my wife and, you know, she would sort of chuckle at a joke and then turn to me and go, was that one of yours? And inevitably it wouldn't be, it would be one that like, but I don't know. I always, just because it resonated and people seem to, you know, it's one of those ones people remember is the slogans down the cars driving through um, Alabama. Alabama, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah just yeah. because it's, it, it's also, it sums up a lot of what happened on Top Gear, which is that you would say something flippant and dumb in the office and the next thing you know, it's being made into television. And I, I just said, what about if they have to drive through Alabama with inflammatory slogans mm-hmm. written down the side of their cars? Never guessing that it would work as well as it did, yeah. which is to say that it genuinely enraged some people. And um, uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd even written the slow, suggested slogans in, in different envelopes and sent them out with the crew because I wasn't on that shoot. Mm. So the presenters had some suggestions to go mm. with, so they didn't have to think of it on the spot. And it, it, I was amazed how well it worked. So I was always quite proud of that. But and the number plate, what the Argentina thing? Yeah. Yeah, I, know. I mean, I always think people look at that and go, well, this is just typical of those idiots. Of course they'd do that. And it's, it's, I could completely understand why people would think that, but absolutely, hand on heart, it was is not. Is that right? Oh, I, I promise you, because wow. the, the concept was we're going to say goodbye to the V8 engine because we sensed it was kind of on its way yeah. out. Yeah. And the way we would plan those specials, and still do with the Grand Tour, is they're sort of, it's a bit chicken and egg, but... Quite often, it just starts with looking at a map of the world on the wall and going, "Where haven't we been?" Yeah, and we and that list is done. getting smaller and smaller, though now, isn't it? You know? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Do you know, it's so difficult now to because I mean, obviously, you know, we haven't been to Runcorn, but mm. there's probably not a lot to do there in the context <laughs> of I mean, an epic road trip. I mean, the, the new so, cro- the new crossing is good. I can vouch for. Oh, that. is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. God, maybe we've overlooked mm. it. But again, it's like Australia. You know, quite often people will write in and go, why didn't you go to Australia more? And and or, and we'll sort of look at it and we'll go, yeah, I'll get a coast to coast in Australia. Massive challenge mm. across that inhospitable interior. But there's not a lot going on. Mm. Yeah. It's just the same landscape for thousands of miles. Mm. And that's not good for telly. We want that sort of a great Top Gear or Grand Tour special has that variation of, of terrain and scenery yeah. and therefore the challenges of getting through the terrain sometimes. And it's actually harder than it looks to find somewhere that has that so those qualities that we're looking for and we realized the tip of south america had got a lot going on and then i guess once we said oh we're gonna it's gonna involve going into argentina then the football idea came up and we were supposed to be getting down to the bottom there and having a game of car football which Mm -hmm. is something that we've done on the show you know and then come back to because it had been so surprisingly successful so we were going to do england argentina you know which obviously anyone who knows anything at all about football is a great sort of grudge match but we thought you know we'll do it in a good natured way with cars Mm -hmm. going back to one of top gear's first principles in that era which was we always said you know cars can solve anything because we used to do these races on the track like fastest religion you know and and things (laughs) (laughs) just because and I think, you know, because obviously we're doing it so tongue-in-cheek, I think we got away with it. We just go, you know, obviously religion causes a lot of conflict, mm. but let's settle this once and for all with motor <laughs> So it fitted into that sort of mantra. And then we were like, well, we also, you know, parallel thought, we want to say goodbye to the V8. We feel like manufacturers are slowly phasing them out. Let's give it a last hurrah. So then we, ha- we were in a meeting. We said to the presenters, each choose a car that ideally, you know, with a V8 that you'd love to have on this trip. And without missing a beat, Jeremy just went Porsche 928. Mm. My probably favourite V8 car. And then he was like, hang on, no, no, wait. 928 GT, one of the later ones. That's my favourite version of that car. Mm. And one of my researchers went online. There were two for sale in Britain at that point. And so she just rang both the numbers in the ads. One ad didn't reply. The other one did. Sent a Porsche mechanic round to make sure it wasn't two cars welded together. He said, no, it's a good one. It's fine. And then it went in a container. And it went across the Atlantic. And that was the registration plate that, that it was it was purchased with. Yeah. And bless her, our researcher was so horrified at, in, in the aftermath of what happened. She went back and she kept screenshots of the ad and the mm. plates were blanked out. So but even ah. when it showed up and the you know the crew showed up on the location, nobody went, uh-oh. Oh well, that was gonna be my question. Did anyone clock it whilst you were out there and went, Oh, 
one of the things I've always said about this is that also when people go, well, of course, it's the kind of thing you do. It's like, I always think, yeah, yeah. It's too subtle for us. I mean, it didn't <laughs> actually say, you know, you had to really, it was a bit of mental gymnastics mm. because what was it? H982. So it, it didn't really say 1982. You had to kind of yeah, cut the H yeah. off. And then FKL, you go, okay, yeah, all right. Sort of, but just that's far too subtle. You've kind of mm. almost got to explain it. It was a, I think it was a local guy who, just saw there was something going on at a local hotel because we were using the car park as a sort of staging point to set up right. all the cameras and everything. Took some pictures of it and went, oh, they're up to their old tricks again. Look at this, Reg. It's obviously a Falklands reference. That mm. went online. Mm. And they'd already started filming by the time um, Rick, this sort of, this this broke. And I remember seeing it in the office in London and going, uh-oh. And we called them out there and went, uh you know there's this thing and they're like yeah we we've been aware of this and uh yeah okay and one of our team was flying out to join the shoot part way through so we had some other plates made up that i think said bell end and the idea i mean this doesn't make any sense whatsoever that, but the idea is somehow that's subtle. i know you see that's exactly what we would do mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Childish, on the nose mm. far too obvious that would be what we would do with number plates but the idea was that Hammond and May had sort of had these British plates made up in Argentina, which, of course, would be completely impossible. But, you know, it's telly. So they were going to have these plates and they would cover the offending plates partway through the shoot. But they couldn't do that from the off because they'd already started filming the yeah. continuity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. And then, obviously, it all started to get a bit hot out there and it was, you know, yeah. getting into actual trouble and genuine sort of what felt like life-threatening situations. And it all got very ugly. But I absolutely swear, hand on heart, we didn't know that was the plate. And, wow, that's amazing. you know, trying to work it back, you go, well, you know, what if we'd gone and we want a plate that's inflammatory in Argentina mm. that references the Falklands? Mm. We'd found that plate. Now, the chances of it being on a Porsche 928 GT are pretty remote because mm. it could have been on a tractor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we yeah, worked yeah. a road trip in tractors. So, you know, it's like there's a lot of things that if you sort of dissect it backwards, made it impossible. Yeah, impossible, yeah. You know, that car had had that reg, although it had. And one of the things I think the papers picked up on was, oh, they changed the plates. That car had at some point in its life had a private plate on it. Okay. So it right. did, you know, but it, but I think it was originally registered with that plate, mm. which was 91, something like that. So it had been a long time with that plate, which yeah, yeah. that was, but yeah, it's, I mean, it was, it, that, that was an extraordinary where we just went, I can see why people think this. Because I would. What, think so, distance. Dave, what what were your thoughts on this? Did you think it was a stunt? Because I certainly did. I did. I yeah, thought, yeah, yeah. Oh, that's clever. Yeah, I yeah. did because I kind of thought, yeah, do you know what? It's a sort of, it's a subtle little nod towards something. And yeah, I I believed it, and I thought that that was the yeah. the, the origins of the trouble. But um, but as you say, you know, it's we've got the we've got the no. the, the true version now. I mean it. It's funny. It's amazing that it that. was an accident. Yeah. That's the incredible thing now, isn't it? It's yeah. it's almost there was a period though when I think the show was going into a bit of a a, a spiral of trouble. It seemed like there was stuff was cropping up, and it felt like a lot of it wasn't our fault or was out of control. You know, sort of um, other things. We had some footage leaked from an edit suite which um, it, it, it was, you know, sort of made it sound like Jeremy had said something absolutely terrible, but he hadn't, and, and the paper sort of made a thing out of it. And we were a bit like, this is bad, because if stuff leaks from edit suites, you know, it's like there's no presenter in the world yeah. would want that to happen, because there's far worse, as I think we probably all know, you know, some some <laughs> presenters are, are a, a, a little bit not like they are on telly. Mm. So... You know that was that was, was in TV terms that should have been a bigger security question for the BBC, but they were too busy focused on giving us a telling off, and we were like, "But we didn't put this on TV. Someone someone stole it, and also he didn't say the word." So mm. what? Mm. Just it was it was it was an odd time, and so and that uh, Argentina thing came along around that point and it just felt like uh, you know the the world is now sort of not aligning the way it used yeah. to. We were very very lucky for a long time and it did at some points feel like our luck had run out yeah, a little yeah, bit. Yeah. you know we were not um sort of enjoying going with the flow we were having to sort of paddle furiously against it you know you said um, before about the fact that you weren't on the alabama shoot for example would mm. you ordinarily was it within your your role to actually be out there on most of those foreign trips uh no i used to go on some of them but 
you know, it's particularly the specials. Mm. They're not scripted. They're, you know, the planning is very important and the deciding where we're going and why and what we're going to get them to do. But once that's all set, mm. hopefully you just wind them up and watch them go. What they sometimes used to like me there for is that if something then happened unexpectedly, we'd have a little huddle yeah. and we'd be like, right, what do we do now? Yeah. What's the next thing? You know, if a car's broken down, that's potentially a nuisance because it's disrupting the journey. <laughs> but how can we almost we weave we into a story? It? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, how do we make this, to, you know, capitalise on it rather than just, you know, cut yeah, count and yeah, yeah, fix it? Bit, bit, but, you know, some of our, our greatest sort of gifts came from the unexpected, mm. but it was then... I think probably part of the secret of the success of the show and the success of Jeremy Rich and James is their ability to be very funny on the fly mm. Mm. and to make good from things that went wrong. Mm. But it's useful sometimes to have an extra brain because they're, you know, having to do the on-camera stuff. So yeah. someone who's just sort of sitting in the back of one of the crew cars. You've got time to think, brain. yeah, you've got time to think yeah. a little bit while they're doing what they're doing, which is not only presenting the show, but also physically doing the driving from A to B, et cetera, et cetera, which is a yeah. time job. You can sit and there thinking, the how do we do this? And then I guess when you see them later on over a beer, when you get to wherever you're going to be, you're like, do you know what? I've got an idea. This is, I mean, this is how it worked. You know, we would have sort of quite long sessions over dinner slash beer where we just go, right, tomorrow this is not going to pan out the way we thought. So what do we do? What's the, you know, what's the story here? Just, just trying to keep it, you know, a sense check on everything. And um, it's, you know, it was, it was, it was a useful thing to do. And, uh, and, but yeah, actually to your point as well, Dave, they did used to do all the driving, Mm. you know, so we were in uh, Bolivia and there came a point where it went dark and we just needed to get to the hotel. We'd been camping for nights and it was miserable. And we've got a promise of a hotel, but we had to get there over some mountains with some really perilous gravelly roads. Mm. And we couldn't film because it was pitch dark. We just had to get there. I remember that one. And so, yeah, it was, it was a good one, that. And mm. I was on that, and I, that was, I mean, it was intense and, and quite uncomfortable at times for various reasons. But uh, so Andy Wilman went to a little shop in a village and bought just cigarettes and, and fizzy drinks. <laughs> And, and beer for people who weren't driving and just went, right, because we were a convoy of us. Mm. And it was Jeremy gone on ahead with his crew because his car was working well. James and Richard were having mechanical problems, so they were with us. And then we just need to get there. And Andy went, right. And he said, right, you go and get in with Hammond, keep him company, because he's not filming, so he doesn't need to be on mm. his own. Mm. And it's it was some of the best driving I've ever seen because we're going down these roads. This Toyota Land Cruiser he was in, the brakes were knackered. Yeah. So he was slowing it down all on the gears. And Hammond is, uh, we, you know, we give him a lot of jip for crashing a lot. But on loose stuff, he is superb. Mm. He's, he's a proper he's rally driver. Mm. So he was just sort of drifting it through these corners and, and slowing it on the brakes and then, you know, maintaining momentum to go up the next mountain. And it was, it was extraordinary. And my job was just to keep lighting and giving him cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> and he had this mass of jump leads and cables and cable ties and things at my feet in the passenger footwell. Mm. And when I got in, Hammond went, watch it. There's uh, that spider town. And there were these huge <laughs> spiders living inside this. But I was like, oh, great. Thank you so much. So, yeah, it was, uh, and, you know, I have a very fond memory of it. At the time, it was like, we could die here. We yeah. genuinely could go over the edge. And when I then switched and I, I, we, we flipped around and I think Andy went in with Richard, I got in with James and James was really tired. And it, it, at one point he sort of went over this big, we, sort of, we felt the car drop and, and I, I looked and he was like, what was that? And I was like, James, I think it was the edge. And he was like, Oh, Oh dear. And, and so <laughs> I, I genuinely, I felt like in retrospect, I went, Oh my God, we could have just casually tumbled off. Yeah. The end of there, Not even known. So um, that, you know, that being on shoot sometimes was actually just sort of keeping the presenter's oh, company, I, I suppose, I which is no hardship. We're in one of those situations, Richard, and, and, and please, I mean this with the, the sort of the greatest compliment is that we could sit and talk about these stories, honestly, all day, right? Because yeah, yeah. we could go through this special that special tell us about this tell us about the nearly off the cliff thing but unfortunately we can't and we're gonna we're, we're rapidly running out of time but i think you're right jason is that it becomes evident now and i never knew this because i obviously knew that this you know your sniff petrol brand if you like if that's not too grand a thing to say <laughs> about it but i hadn't realized a how long it had been established and also b how much of it was 
the basis, I suppose, of Top Gear yeah. and, and ultimately the Grand Tour. Yeah, I suppose it was... I mean, for me, doing Sniff Petrol was a kind of shop window because mm. it never really earned me any money, but it was like it was a way of showing what I could do. Mm. And um, But I think in terms of the success of Top Gear, it was a, it was a perfect storm because Jeremy Richard and James are all brilliant writers in their own right and very bright men, although they sometimes mm-hmm. play dumb on telly. They yeah. are very, very intelligent. Andy Willman yeah. is, you know, is a maestro at this stuff. Mm-hmm. And then, yeah. you know, we had people like uh, Jim and Rowley that I mentioned earlier, but also a whole load of other producers, researchers, production people who came together to make that show what it was. And I think we just got lucky. You know, we, we kind of, everything just melded and I was yeah. proud to be a little part Planets of it's aligned. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I don't think, we just couldn't do it again because it wasn't just getting the right people together. It was also, we benefited from things like the invention of YouTube. Yeah. It came along at just the right time. People started clipping out bits of Top Gear, which allowed people outside the UK to see what we were up to. Mm. And that created a buzz, you know, particularly in the US, I think, at the time. And then broadcasters there started going, what is this show? We need to buy this show or we need to make our own version. You know, so things like that helped us to become this global success. Yeah. But you try it now and it wouldn't happen like that yeah. because, you know. Right, right, you, right we, time. We, yeah, right time, right place. The timing was yeah. uncanny and I just don't think it would ever happen again. So I consider myself to be very lucky to have been a part of it. Well, it's a brilliant story. Like, like, it's a lovely it's, story, isn't it's it? It's an a absolute, really interesting story. It's an absolutely brilliant story. And listen, you know, we often ask, well, you, you know your, yourself, Richard, you've heard this uh, this shambolic podcast before. We normally ask people about <laughs> what about what, what it was like to pass their driving test or their first car. Do you know what? Frankly, neither of us could give a toss because actually this is far more interesting and we sort of run yes. out of time on that. However, there's one question which we always ask, and you know what's coming it's about music yeah, and motoring, yeah. right? They go well together. So please, yeah. we need Mr. Porter, your fantasy drive. Where are you? Where are you going? What are you in? And what are you listening to? Um, I mean, I know a lot of people that remember or sometimes don't remember until it's too late that they should say their their partner or something, which I would I would love to I'd bring my wife. Um, but if not, <laughs> then <laughs> Uh, let's assume that we've already done our road trip sure. and now I'm doing a different mm. one. Because, uh, I, I, I just because, you know, saying, oh, I'd like to be my wife is a bit predictable, isn't it? But although I would, and we would go, I don't know, through uh, like uh, up through California or I've never been to up that top bit of Canada in the in the sort of northeast, like Labrador around there. Okay. I gather yeah, it's really beautiful. Yeah. So maybe we'll go there instead. And my wife, who's American, can just moan about Canadians the whole time because. <laughs> She's always like, I was going, Canadians are so nice, aren't they? She's like, they're such losers. And it's like, <laughs> okay, neighborly rivalry, is there? And um, we could do that. But if not that, I do a real journey that I did, which is only short, but it's something that I did years ago, which is uh, I supported some friends of mine on a thing called the Thunder Walk, which is a 24-hour walk across the Brecon Beacons. Yeah. And some of my oldest mates from way back. And I was the support crew and i borrowed a land rover defender 110 on the older ones mm. which i absolutely adore mm. and i now have an old 90 and admittedly my mates weren't in the car with me at this point but for this they can be i was driving down from the top of the mountains down into brecon itself on a summer's evening the sun was just going down it catches those mountains like nothing else you've seen it's just beautiful and i was listening to new order one of my favorite bands and and, and had the windows down, the defenders, this warm summer air mm. just flowing through the interior. And I got down into Brecon, I pulled up and I went and got fish and chips and I ate the fish oh. and chips off the bonnet of the landy oh, for the camel pot. And I could not have been happier. I was just yeah. like, this is a moment of zen. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe I could. My mates are doing the walk. My wife's with me. She's keeping me company. There we go. I've got myself out of that situation. <laughs> it's, it's my wife and, I, and, and we're driving to Brecon. <laughs> everyone beautifully written yeah 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 beautifully <laughs> written and, and also beautifully maneuvered as well i think you know in terms of we know that we know that you've had your brush with diplomatic situations before as we may have discussed in south america but i think on this occasion you've handled that like an absolute professional on that note jason i think you need to take us out well unfortunately we have to say goodbye uh, for this week's fueling around powered by adrian flux as the uk's largest specialist insurance broker 
Adrian Flux will tailor a quote to your exact needs and help you save money on your car, your bike, or even your home insurance. Uh, Richard, thank you, mate. It's been really, mm. really ace. Oh, thank you for having Superb. me. Superb. Uh, don't forget, you can get in touch with us, as always, on Twitter, at Jason Plato or at David Vitti. And if you like what you've heard, please feel free to give us a five-star rating, press the follow button, and share the podcast on all your socials. Thanks for listening, and we'll catch you next time. Ta-da. 